for another um, couple of days about basic ideas from algorithms. So, um, so what did we talk about last time? We talked about recursion. So in the beginning of chapter three, there's this classic example of the Towers of Hanoi puzzle, which has this standard recurs recursive uh, solution. So, you know, you, you're probably already familiar with this. My two-year-old daughter has a puzzle like this, although I haven't quite convinced her that she has to only move one thing at a time and that, uh, you know, she can't just roll them across the floor. But, you know, two-year-olds are much more creative than we are, so it's hard to get them to stay within the rules. Um, so I'm sure you all didn't, you don't, tell me, raise your hand if you already know this puzzle. Okay, well, not everyone. So I want to move these three disks, or in general, these N disks, from this peg to this peg, and but there are rules. I can only move I can only move one at a time, and I'm not allowed to put a larger one on top of a smaller one. And there's this standard uh, recursive solution which says the following: It says if you know how to solve this puzzle for n disks, so, sorry, it says if you already know how to solve the puzzle for n minus one disks, then take these n minus one disks, all but the largest one move them to the third peg, then move the largest one there, and finally, again, using the method for solving the puzzle with n minus 1 disks, move these there. And now you're done. And in this case, the number of moves it takes, the total number of moves it takes to move n disks is uh, first the number it takes to move n minus 1 disks, then the move it takes to move that biggest disk, then this number again to move the n minus 1 disks on top of the biggest disk. And this is one of these classic puzzles in, uh, recur in solving recurrence relations, and proving this is pretty easy. And um, anyway, so this isn't an algorithm, right? And it's it, because we're not solving a problem in the computer science sense, right? We're not taking an input and producing some output that calculates some function or says yes or no. It's, it's a puzzle. You know, we're, we sort of have a fixed task to do, and we're trying to get through this task. Um, and it's certainly not that the idea of recurrence, that the idea of recursion helps us solve it in polynomial time. It takes exponential time. But 
Again, this isn't really computation time. It's more like number of moves or something like that. But it's still a very nice example of recursion. Um, prove that this is the fastest way to do this. So prove that there's no way to solve the puzzle with fewer moves than this. I mean, this is a good question to ask because in the world of algorithms, it's often very hard to prove that we have the best algorithm. But I claim that we can prove that this is the most efficient way to solve this puzzle. Can you tell me what overall type of proof I would like to use? Okay. So I, I assume that I, I assume that I have a uh, solution that takes fewer moves, mm -hmm. and that will be impossible. Like, right? um, you get there, or you have to kind of violate viol the rules. Yeah. You can't move the bottom disk until the ones on top of it are already gone, and there's an empty peg to move it to. Yes. So. If you could have moved that top in the shorter moves than what you got there, then right. No, but I, I think that's the heart of it, right? So I, I, I think it would be a very good exercise for you all to do. So write down a formal proof that for all n, this recursive method, which says, for instance, to move n disks from, from I to J, first, well, let's write it like pseudocode, move the, move the n minus 1 smallest disks from I to K, where K means whatever the other peg is, whatever the third peg is other than I and J, then move the largest from I to j, and then finally move the n minus 1 disks from k to j. All right. So what we want is a proof. I, I mean, maybe there's a way to do it with a, a proof using contradiction. But I, I would be inclined to say, let's prove this using induction. Right. I mean, after all, the first thing you should try to do if I challenge you is this is this the most efficient method? The first thing you should try to do is set n equal to 1 or 2 or 3 and stare at it and see if you can do better than this method. Well, if n is 1, then this method says move it from there to there. Can't do better than that. Okay. But, but I mean, in the inductive step, kind of got to use contradiction here, right? You could phrase it that way, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but so, so the heart, so, so the idea is that, um, you know, base case, this is the best method for n minus, n equal one disks, a single disk. Actually, an even better base case is this is the best method when n equals zero. Do nothing is the most efficient thing you could do. So, this, this moves zero disks and zero moves, and we can't do better than that. Okay. So then the induction step would say, um, assume this is the best method for n minus 1 disks. Then, as you said, the, the intuition is, you know, uh, you have to move the n minus 1 smaller disks before you can move the largest. <coughs> and you have to move them to the third peg, which I called K, so that you can move the largest to an empty peg. 
And once you've done that, well, now the only thing left to do is move them on top of it. Mm -hmm. And again, we assume by induction that we already know the best way to do that. Okay. So then moving the n minus 1 disks on top of it is the only thing left to do. Okay, so I mean, this is 90% of the proof. I think that, you know, how do you write proofs? You write proofs the same way you write essays. Now, I know that in this day and age, unfortunately, you're told that an essay has five paragraphs, an introduction, a bunch of horse hockey, roughly three paragraphs long, and a conclusion. And it's true that in, in the essay sections of standardized tests, it's been shown that you can take off your glasses and look at a blurry version 10 feet away and just by the shape of it predict with 90% accuracy what grade it will be received. So unfortunately, you know, that's not how you should write an essay. You should write an essay by writing it and then taking yourself out of your own mental shoes and putting yourself in the shoes of a friendly but skeptical reader who at each point in your reasoning will say, why? Or are you sure that's true? Or why, why must that follow? And then you tighten up the places where there are gaps in your reasoning, and then you do it again. And you keep doing this until you honestly believe that a skeptical reader who is not you and is not telepathic and who might not share your intuitions but who only knows what you've written would be convinced. That's how to write a proof, right? It does not have to be written in Greek. And I, I grade proofs accordingly. Um, so, you know, maybe there are places in this that need to be tightened up just a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, but just imagine, just imagine saying why, you know, as I have to deal with all the time. Um, okay, anyway. So it's kind of nice that in this case, we can actually prove that this is the best solution. Because for most problems in computer science, we can't prove that. We can't prove that our algorithms are the best ones. So it's a nice example. Um, all right. So we talked a bit, a bit about divide and conquer. So we used our example of fast multiplication, where we divided an n-digit number into two halves, the high order half, the high order digits or bits, and the low order ones. Each of these had n over two digits, and we did a divide and conquer. Then we noticed this little trick that reduced the number of pairs we needed to multiply, and we got a much better algorithm than we would have thought naively was possible. Um, here's another example of that, and I know you've seen this, but I mean, I think it's worth talking about, which is sorting. We'll do it very quickly, I promise. So let's look at merge sort. So how does merge sort work? It is a recursive algorithm. In particular, it's a divide and conquer algorithm. It says you want to sort this list of numbers or strings or whatever, break it into two halves, sort them both, and then merge them back together. And you know, one way to do this is sort of put them like this and then sort of make a little pile where you take the lowest, whichever of these two things is lower, and you put it in the pile and then remove it from that list. And so it's kind of like zippering the two things together. OK, so that's merge sort. You've all seen this before, right? OK, so, but I just want to remind you. And um, a standard way of calculating the running time of merge sort, right, if you literally wanted to know the precise running time in seconds, you'd have to need to know all sorts of details, the clock speed of your computer, where is this memory, is it in the cache on the chip where it's easy to, to access quickly, is it in a physically distant place on the chip, is it written on a hard drive 100 miles away, blah, blah, blah. But a standard way to talk about running time is to focus on the number of comparisons that we do. So how often do I ask about two things, x and y, is x less than y or not? Which of these two things is bigger? Well, so when does that happen? So 
you know, it happens when I do this merging process. So if you have already sorted these two halves for me, right, recursion is a lot like induction. In induction, you assume that some smaller version of your statement has already been proved. In recursion, you assume that some smaller part of your problem has already been solved. Okay? And indeed, when you prove by induction that a recursive algorithm works, the structure of your proof and the structure of the algorithm are essentially the same. Right? So if I want to prove that merge sort works, I say, well, assume inductively that it works on smaller lists. Then, assuming this is sorted and this is sorted, if I zipper them together, you know, if this is 1, 3, 4, 5, 9, and this is 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, well, clearly this process of taking the smaller thing from each one and adding it to the list will produce a sorted list. I had two fours, sorry about that. Okay. All right. So my proof that merge sort works pretty much consists of running merge sort in our heads, right? And, and, and uh, okay, anyway, maybe I've said this enough times. So what's the total number of comparisons that I need to sort a list of size n well, assuming for simplicity that n is even, I have to run merge sort on the two halves. So it's that. <coughs> um, since that's how long it takes merge sort, how many comparisons it takes merge sort to sort something of size n over 2. Then I just have this process here. But if the total number of things is n, then this merging process asks essentially n times which one of these two I should take. It's actually n minus 1 at worst, because eventually one of these two things is empty. Oh, but the last thing we care about it in this class is the difference between n and n minus 1. After all, n is a billion or something. So let's write it like that. And then uh, you should be able to show that the solution goes is essentially this. Um, I should also tell you the base case, which is that it does not take any comparisons to sort a list of size 1, because any list of size 1 is already sorted. And anyway, so this is theta of n log n, right, where theta means a constant times n log n. No, no more and no less. OK. Well, I bring this up as another example of divide and conquer, but for another reason as well, which is, is this the best sorting algorithm? So, and what I mean by that, I know that there's also quicksort. And quicksort also, although the constants are different, on a, quicksort on average takes this long, which is actually a little bit bigger than this. It does more comparisons. In practice, quicksort is usually faster because it works in place in memory, blah, blah, blah. But the number of comparisons is, again, order n log n. So here's my question. Is there a sorting algorithm which uses fewer than n log n comparisons? Is there a sorting algorithm which, for instance, uses only big O of n comparisons? Unless it's not. Yes. yes, OK. So some of you already know this story. OK, well, prove it. Prove that there is no comparison-based sorting algorithm which needs fewer than order n log n. Uh -huh. We can build this three or four possible comparisons. Yeah. All right. OK, maybe somebody who doesn't already know. <laughs> So you know the children's game, 20 questions. It's traditional to start out by saying animal, vegetable, or mineral. But after that, you have to start asking yes or no questions. Okay? And you have 20 questions to do it. How many different possible objects in the world, real and fictional, if fictional ones are allowed, can we distinguish with 20 questions? I mean, yes or no questions. There are yes or no questions. Two to the twenty. Two to the twenty. Right. So I mean, if which is uh, you know, it's only a million actually. So um, 
I mean, even if you ask the best yes or no questions in the world, right? So here's the universe of all possible things your friend could be thinking of. The ideal yes or no question would divide this universe exactly into two equal halves. And then once you learn that the answer is yes, say, and that it's one of these, your next question should divide this into exactly two halves, right? I mean, a really bad set of questions would be, uh, first question, is it my cat? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you, you really, I mean, you, you want to divide the world into equal halves at each point. To put it differently, um, what you have is, as you just said, a little tree where I ask a question here, I get a yes or no, here I ask a question, I get a yes or no, and so on. I don't have to ask the same question here as I did there. I can, I can and I certainly will usually adapt which question I ask depending on what answers I got to previous questions. But if I ask T questions, then at best, I, if you, I have a binary tree of depth T, and how many leaves does that have? How many leaves does it, if the depth is T? There are two to the T leaves here. Okay. All right. And to put it differently, if the number of different things, which I'll call capital N, that we're trying to distinguish is bigger than 2 to the t, or to put it differently, if the number of questions you have is less than log base 2 of n, if the number of questions you're allowed to ask is less than that, then you simply won't be able to succeed all the time. I mean, if you like, it's a, if you like, if you want to be fancy about it, you could say, well, it's a pigeonhole principle argument. If I have only 2 to the t leaves, and n is bigger than that, where n is the set of possible objects, there's some leaf here where two different objects, this one and this one, both live on that leaf. And what does that mean? That means that whether you're thinking of this object or this object, I get exactly the same sequence of answers to the questions I ask, which means I have no hope of distinguishing them. Okay. All right, so if I'm trying to sort n objects, little n objects, what is big n? How many different situations do I need to deal with? How many different scenarios do I need to be able to recognize? n factorial. Because there are n factorial different orders that these n things could be in. And I need to find out which order it's in. If I don't know what order the input is in, there's no way that I can rearrange it correctly to produce a sorted list. Therefore, the number of questions I need is at least log base 2 of n factorial. And if you know Sterling's approximation, you know that n factorial is roughly, I mean, really roughly, it's n to the n. A little less roughly it's that, a little less roughly it's that, but if we're going to take logs, we only care about this first part. So log base 2 of n to the n is just n times log base 2 of n. <coughs> so this is nice, actually. It, not only does it say you need order log n, it gives a lower bound on the constant in front of log n. It says that merge sort is essentially optimal as far as the number of constants goes. It says that I can't even get by with, say, one half of that. There's no way to sort a list with half as many comparisons, or even 0.9 as many comparisons as merge sort uses. Right? Well, gosh, I mean, Proving that something, that an algorithm is optimal doesn't look so hard. We, we just handled two of them in 10 minutes. Well, the problem with this argument is that it's not actually about computation. It's really about information. So the way this argument works is it says the sorting algorithm has to learn what order the input is in. Okay, and it says it can't even get off the ground, no matter how clever it is, until it is in possession of that information. And in order to gain that information, 
if we assume that the way it gains it is by asking yes or no questions, is this less than that, then it needs this many questions. Okay. Um, the so it's a, it's an argument about how do you even get enough information to solve the problem. Not it's not an argument about how cleverly can you manipulate that information doing the computation part once you have that information. Okay. And the problem is that we're never going to be able to prove with any argument remotely like this that some problem takes exponential time if the specification of the problem only involves a polynomial number of bits. Because once you read the bits, you have all the information you need. Okay. The only way we'll ever be able to prove that a problem takes exponential time is if we look at how hard is it to compute what you want to compute about that information, not how hard it is to get that information in the first place. So do you understand the distinction? Do you understand what I'm saying about information versus computation? So the, the point is that the, the picture is that your, the sorting algorithm needs to do two things. Okay, It needs to learn what order the input is in. And then it needs to do something with that information, and rearrange the input so it's sorted. All right. And what we're saying here is that we can prove a lower bound on the time it takes just to learn that information if we assume that the way it learns it is by asking yes or no questions or in particular making comparisons. Okay. I mean, basically, it's learning one bit of information at a time is the idea. And if you need to learn one bit of, if you can, you know, if you are learning one bit of information at a time, it will take you log of n factorial time steps to learn what order the input is in. Okay. So the, the picture is that, you know, an algorithm, so, so here's the input. The picture is that the algorithm first has to extract some information from this input. And then it has to do something with that information, which I'm calling the computation part. And then it has to get the answer. Okay. So in sorting, what I'm trying to say is that we can prove a lower bound on how long this process takes just by focusing on this stage. But let's go back to our problem about does a graph have a Hamiltonian path? The, the learning about the graph, that's pretty quick. You know, just read the description of the graph I sent you. Okay. So in other words, this, this certainly never takes more than polynomial time because at, a, you know, at worst you could do it by just reading in every bit of the input I sent. So the case of Hamiltonian graphs or other, as we will see, NP-complete problems are cases where we believe that even once you know everything about the input, you have all the information you need, that this part is hard. The question is, what do you do with that information? And now you have to do some difficult search. Okay. So... You know, this type of argument might be fine for showing that we need n log n time to prove to search something, but there's no hope that this type of argument will prove that it takes exponential time to search through the space of possible uh, Hamiltonian paths of a graph. Does that make sense now? Are you saying that it's, it's harder to prove something about what the computation of the problem will be, rather than prove something about just basically what information the problem contains. Or, yeah, yes. I mean, information is a pretty well understood subject, right? Uh, I mean, we know, and this, this goes back to Claude Shannon and so on. I mean, we know that if there are capital N, you know, if there are capital N different signals I want to send you, okay? 
I want to send you, let's go to lunch, there's a test tomorrow, uh, please don't order anchovies on the pizza or, um, I don't know, the fourth thing. Uh, or please do. Okay, those are four things. Log base two of four is two. I have to send you two bits of information. There's just no way to squeeze four possible messages into less than two bits of information. Okay, and so, I mean, it, for information, we have very clear lower bounds. For computation, we don't. Okay. So, you know, if computation is more like, here's an n-bit string. There's some complicated property of it. Um, and I want, to tell, I want you to tell me whether it's true or not, where that string represents, say, a graph. And I want, to tell, I want you to tell me, does this n-bit string represent a graph for which there is a Hamiltonian path? Well, OK, so one lower bound on this is n. I have to show you the string. Well, great. Good. Fine. But what we believe and what we are not able to prove is that it now takes time exponential as a function of n to compute this complicated property to tell whether or not, say, there's a Hamiltonian path. Okay. Does that clear things up? So um, now, as some of you clearly know, it's actually a little bit of a lie to say that there is an order n log n lower bound on the time it takes to sort things. Because in practice, we're often sorting a particular kind of thing like numbers. And if you know that the things you're sorting are, say, numbers, then there are lots of other tricks you can play, right? I mean, if I know that I'm sorting, say, exam scores that range between 0 and 100, then I don't need to sit around asking, is 45 less than 79? There are other strategies I can use, like I could have a bin ranging from 40 to 50, and I could put 45 in that bin, and I could have another bin ranging from 70 to 80, and I could put 79 in that bin, and then I could look inside the bins and do a little bit more sorting within them. And a fancy version of this is called radix sort, and radix sort runs in essentially linear time, essentially order n time, if the things being sorted are numbers with a constant number of digits. And that's because that is not a comparison-based sort. It is doing stuff with the input, which does not consist of asking a series of yes or no questions. Um, on the other hand, suppose you were being a good object-oriented programmer, and there was a user-defined class of objects which you were being asked to sort. You don't know whether they're numbers. You don't know whether they're strings. But I have defined for you what I mean by this operator. Okay. Well, now you don't get to look under the hood. You don't get to look inside the objects in good object-oriented form. The only interface I'm letting you have with the input is to ask, is this less than that or not? Well, now in this setting, n log n really is a lower bound. Okay. Because I'm only giving you this limited channel by which you're allowed to learn things about the input. And it, by the way, it is not a coincidence that if you look at big user libraries, I'm told that when you sort uh, strings or, or numbers, you know, standard libraries will use quick sort. But when you're sorting a user defined class, they'll use merge sort for exactly this reason. Um, anyway, so, OK. So we know how to prove lower bounds about information, but not about computation, roughly speaking. At least, you know, the, the lower bounds that we can prove about computation, which we'll talk about later in the semester, they're hard, and so far, they're very limited in what we can prove. Um, all right. A any questions before I go on? Yes. Is it true that, that any kind of uh, I mean, any kind of algorithm which asks a yes or no question would run in around 
because it's polynomial time. I mean, I'm just kind of trying to tie it with the homework problem that you gave in last homework in which, uh, I mean, just because an oracle was given to us, which was tell us that uh, Mr. Hamiltonian path exists. And by asking a yes or no question, we could find out whether there is a Hamiltonian path. I mean, so, yeah, so, so the, 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 the question is um, referring to the homework about, I'm saying this because I don't, should I repeat the question for the folks in Los Alamos? Okay, so the question was, you know, from the homework we had this oracle where we could ask the yes or no question, is there a Hamiltonian path or, or is there a Hamiltonian cycle? And using the answers to those yes or no questions, can we actually find one? And there's a couple of different ways to do this, like removing one edge at a time and saying, is there still a Hamiltonian path? And then you remove another edge and you whittle the graph down until the Hamiltonian path is the only thing left. Um, so uh, by the way, let me just give these things names. The decision problem is the you know, yes or no, typically does something exist? like a Hamiltonian path. And then the function problem, which you could equally, equally well call the search problem is, you know, so this is, does x exist? Where in this case, x is a path. The function problem is, please give me x. Um, so the purpose of that homework problem was to demonstrate that most of the time, if you can answer this question efficiently, you can also answer this question efficiently, okay? So I phrased it in terms of an oracle. If an oracle is willing to answer this question for you, can you ask her a polynomial number of questions on different versions of the graph and thus learn, solve this problem in a polynomial amount of time? But another way to say it is, if you realize that there was a polynomial time algorithm for this problem, you would then have a polynomial time algorithm for this one because it would call this one as a subroutine a polynomial number of times. So I bring this up mainly because it's, it's good to realize that when this problem is easy, this one is usually easy as well, which is nice to know. And the other direction is true too? Well, this one is meaningless unless the answer to this one is yes. Um, so it's, it's, there's not always a simple way of going from here to there, but, but most of the time there is. So your question was, can we prove a lower bound on the number of times we need to ask this question in order to solve this question? And I've never thought about that before, but it seems like the same kind of 20 questions argument would work. I mean, if I had a graph, right, there are indeed n factorial different orders in which I could try to visit all the vertices. So depending on the structure of the graph, there could conceivably be n factorial different paths I might want to try. Now, I mean, if each vertex only has, say, three neighbors, then actually the number of paths is more like just two to the n, because from each vertex there's two other vertices I could go to. Um, but log of two to the n is still order n. So I think you're basically right that it, this is a proof that we need, we need to ask order, we need to ask the oracle order n questions to solve this problem. The, the particular uh, solution I gave, I think was pretty generous, like n cubed or even n to the fourth or something silly like that. So I guess the question is, can, you know, can we do much better than that? And maybe we can. But you're right, in that setting, we're learning from the oracle. And what we're trying to learn is the path. And if there are capital N possible paths, I guess we need something like, we need to ask something like log N questions. Um, well, my intuition about this question is that it's kind of different from the solving problem in the mm -hmm. sense that you cannot effectively you know, divide it, go to half, you just el eliminate the other half kind of by a single yes or no question. But just on a one edge basis kind of, is this, this edge necessary in this Hamiltonian cycle uh, pass? This is all we, we were doing. In the so you're saying it might be worse than log of n factorial or whatever? Because each question, 
each question might not divide the space of possible paths into two equal halves, right? I mean, if I told you, that, I mean, right, th this this yeah, log I mean, this log base two of n. Do you like do you like in kind of transitive relation in the in the story? You cannot just eliminate, you know. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I, I should emphasize that this is a no, this is a lower bound, right? Yeah. So this is assuming that at every stage you can think of a question, or there is a question you can ask, which would divide the world into two equal parts among the remaining possible solutions, oh, oh, yeah. right? And actually doing this can be hard. So, um, you know, if, if your questions fail to divide it into exactly two equal halves at each stage, then the number of questions you'll need will be greater than this. Mm -hmm. So this is a lower bound for these ideal questions. Uh, okay. So let me let me give one more example of a divide and conquer algorithm, which is actually going to be useful later on in several contexts. So raising things to high powers. So you know this isn't this isn't so hard. I I, I teach it in the undergrad algorithms class, and you've probably seen it, but it's, again, worth, worth reminding ourselves about. So let's say x and y and p are n bit numbers, OK? I would like to do the following. Calculate x to the y mod p. Okay. So first, give me a method which does not take polynomial time. <laughs> give, me, give me the simplest method which you would think of if you'd never thought about the problem before, but which regrettably takes exponential time. Exponential is a function of n, the number of digits. Um, don't, don't worry about the mod part. I mean, it's really the x to the y part that we care about. Multiply x y times, and yeah. when we multiply x by x, we are making additions. So yes. So the bad method is multiply x by itself, or by whatever you have so far, y times. You know, this takes at a minimum uh, y time. I mean, that's not even that's not even paying attention to how long each of these multiplication takes. The point is you do y of them. But this is terrible because y is an n bit number. And if n is 1,000, this is 2 to the 1,000. Okay. So this takes exponential time. So what's the good method? Right. So the good method is take x, square it, multiply that by itself, so thus squaring it again. And now, for simplicity, if y were a power of 2, then the point is, now we just do log base 2 of y, which is order n yeah. multiplications. Um, now, we need to be a little bit careful here. This mod p is actually important, right? What if I weren't? What if I just asked you for x to the y? What trouble would we get into? Just number too long. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that if y is roughly two to the thousand, say, if n is a thousand, then x, if x were three, x is would then be dub then x to the y would be doubly exponential in n, which would mean that the number of digits would be exponential in n, right? Which means that it takes exponential time even to write it down. All right. So it's a little bit unfair to ask me to solve in polynomial time questions where even delivering the input to you takes exponential time because it's exponentially large. Ah, oh, but if p is an n-bit number, then at each stage of this squaring, 
what I do is I square and take the result mod p, square that and take the result mod p, and so on. And then these intermediate results never go beyond n digits. So, so you know, so order n times, we square two numbers which have n. We we we, we multiply a number which is n digits by itself. Um, that only takes. Well, using the grade school method, it takes n squared time. As we saw last time, we could do a little better if we wanted. But if all we care about here is that this whole thing takes polynomial time, I actually don't care whether you use the grade school method or, or a cleverer method for multiplying n digit numbers. And then we take the result mod p, and that's also not hard to do in, I think, n squared time, basically using long division and then taking the remainder. So anyway, I guess order n squared plus order n squared, of course, is order n squared. And so I guess this whole thing takes n cubed time. But in any case, what's important for our purposes is it takes polynomial time. Now, this is important in several settings. One is that um, if we have time this semester, we'll talk a little bit about cryptography. Um, so as a lot of you already know, um, RSA public key cryptography involves raising something to a high power. Indeed, when you, when you encrypt your message, you basically take your message and raise it to a power which is the encryption key. And both of these things have n digits. And so to do this efficiently, you use repeated squaring. Um, there's another. There's another place where this will come up, though, um, which is in, in a, a kind of algorithm to find shortest paths, where rather than squaring numbers, I will be squaring matrices. I'll be multiplying a matrix by itself. And the matrix will describe where I can get to from one ver what, what vertices I can get to from what other vertices in a certain number of steps. And each time I square this matrix, I'll be doubling the number of steps. And this turns out to be, um, in some ways, a very good method for finding shortest paths or telling whether a path exists in a graph. And it, again, uses this repeated squaring. It's, it's rather different from other algorithms for shortest path that you might have heard of already, like Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, anyway, we'll get to that later. So all right, so those are some good examples of divide and conquer. Um, so we have 25 minutes left. Let's do this typesetting problem, this dynamic programming problem. OK? But any more questions about this before we proceed? I mean, hopefully, you know, if this went to buy a little fast, try to get, try to get comfortable with these notions of if y is an n-digit number, it's exponentially large. x to the y is doubly exponential. It has an exponential number of digits, blah, blah, blah. You know, Try to get to the point where what we said here flows pretty smoothly for you about why this method takes exponential time and this method takes polynomial time. All right. So. Now let's get back to dynamic programming. So let's restate this typesetting problem in uh, with better notation than I started to last time. OK. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I am trying to typeset a paragraph, and I have a list of n words of whose lengths are w1, w2, and so on. OK? And let's say that uh, L is the length you know, these lengths could be measured in characters or pixels or picas as the, pr as the printers used to. I, I don't care. Um, inches, whatever. L is the length of a line. 
Okay. And now um, my goal is to decide where the line breaks are going to go. So let's say that the top line is going to consist of the first word, and then the second word, and then so on up to what I'll call W sub J sub 1. That's the last word on the first line. Okay. So in this case, I would be choosing to put a line break after the J sub first word. Well, then the next line is going to start with the word after that, and then it will end with the J sub tooth, J sub second. How do you say that word? Okay. And there will be another line break there, and so on. Okay. So insert line breaks means choose J1, J2, and so on up to JL, where JL is the number of lines of your paragraph. And these are, you know, these index the words where that's the end of the line. Okay, is the notation okay so far? Yeah. All right. So what is the cost of this paragraph? I want a minimum cost paragraph. So the idea is that whenever I have to stretch spaces out to, you know, you know this word justify, right? So, you know, when you write justify text, it's when you space things out so that the right edge of the paragraph looks straight, okay? Often when we typeset poems, we don't do this, but for text, we usually do this. So here's the cost. On each line, the extra space is, I'll define it as, uh, or, or the, yeah, the, 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 the total space between the words. I'll define this as E, and this is the length of the line minus the sum of the lengths of those words. So for instance, on the top line, total length of the words. Okay? So the idea is here's, here's the length of a line or the width of my paragraph. I have a word here, a word here, a word here. E is the total amount of space between all the words. Now let's assume that I want a space to take up a one unit of length. And my cost will be related to how much I have to stretch the spaces on that line. So I'll say that the cost of a, give, of a single line, which I'll call um, C sub I for the ith line. So I'll call E sub I the total, uh, the, the total space on that line, except then this would range from W sub J sub I plus, you know, anyway, it would be the, this would be the sum of the words on that line, okay? okay all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this by the total number of spaces, just the number of them, and this is um, the number of words on that line minus one, which is this. I don't want you to worry about the details of this, because in the end, these things won't matter very much. In the end, the cool thing about our algorithm is it will be able to handle nearly any cost function you care to invent. This is just an example of one. And actually, if you look inside a computer typesetting system like Tech, it'll use something like this. You know, so, I mean, when Donald Knuth designed tech, right, he had to decide, well, how angry should the program be? How upset should it be as, this, as, the, uh, as these things get stretched out more? Should it be like a spring, in which case, like, the energy of a stretched spring would grow quadratically? Um, so he sort of settled on this, you know, sort of trial and error. 
he settled on this and found that it seemed to produce good results. But this is an example. All right. So now you could put all of this inside a box and not worry anymore for the purposes of the algorithm about the details of what's inside the box. What matters is that once I decide where to put a line break, there is some cost for that line. And now my goal is to choose these j's in a way that minimizes the total cost, which is the sum over all the lines of the cost of each line. Okay. And like I said at the end of last time, it is not obvious that this problem is easy to solve. Because again, uh, a greedy strategy does not generally work. It's not like minimum spanning tree. Here, if what we do is focus entirely on making the first line look really, really nice, which is what the greedy strategy would do, right? It would start at the beginning of the paragraph, it would get happy with the first line and then move on to the second, and it would say, well, um, my total cost, which I'll call capital C, what is it? It's the cost of the first line plus um, the total cost of everything that comes after. So let me introduce one more, uh, actually let's not call this C. Let me introduce one more little bit of, of, uh, of notation. So let me call F of I as the total cost of a paragraph the opt you know the total optimal cost the minimum of the part of the paragraph starting with the ith word okay so in particular what we care about is f sub 1 which is the total cost of the whole paragraph All right. Why am I introducing this notation? It's because once you decide where the first line break goes, okay, so let's say that the first line break goes after the J plus first word. The total cost is then the cost of that top line, C sub 1, plus F of, well, I guess actually del, uh, J sub 1 plus 1. OK? <coughs> all right, so the total cost is the cost of the first line plus the rest of it. That's all I'm saying. All right. Now, what would the greedy strategy do? It would minimize C1. But minimizing C1 might be a terrible idea because the remaining words might be very awkward to typeset. And minimizing this might actually maximize that. So you can't minimize the sum of the two of these things just by first minimizing this and then trying to solve the rest of the problem. There really are trade-offs here. And like I said, if you if you play with a system like this, and I, so I forget, like, uh, uh, in, in the Mac operating system inside this thing called Coco, there's some pretty fast heuristic for typesetting paragraphs. And I think Microsoft, I, I read somewhere that Microsoft uses the greedy strategy and that Apple doesn't. And this was probably written by an Apple fan. So I, I'm not sure exactly what, I'm not sure exactly what strategy they use. But on some of these things, you know, you're, you're working on a word processor and you sort of change something on the second to last line and you notice that things have gotten, it, it then immediately shuffles things around on one of the first two lines of the paragraph, and maybe you've wondered why. Well, it's doing something like this. Um, so unlike minimum spanning tree, where there is no issue of a balancing act between short term and long term, um, here there really is. So it's not obvious that we're going to solve this problem easily. So, but. For those of you who've seen dynamic programming, which in some form is most of you, um, you know that actually we can do this. So what we should have said actually is that since f is the optimum, 
this is the minimum over all possible locations of that first line break of the resulting cost of the first line plus the total cost of typesetting the rest of the paragraph. Okay. More generally, if I have um, if I have determined what uh, well, okay. So, so more generally, for any j, right? F of j is the minimum over all possible locations of the next line break, which I guess I'll, I'll call j prime or something, of the cost of a line from, you know, that includes the words from j to j prime, plus the cost of everything after that. Alrighty. Well, you're probably wondering, for those of you who already know this technique, you're wondering when I'm going to get to it. So here's a recursive algorithm. So, which calculates f of j. <coughs> so it says, no, let me re remove this since we don't actually care about it anyway. So it says something like, for j prime, running from j plus 1 to n, the very end of the paragraph, you know, take the minimum over all these values of the cost of a line from j to j prime plus this same function, which makes it recursive. So, you know, my pseudocode does not look very much like code, but, you know, in fact, I'll get annoyed with me if I, I I'll, I'll get annoyed with you, I'm sorry. I'll get annoyed with you if I ask you for pseudocode and you write code. I really don't want to read code. I want to read pseudocode. But I guess what we'll say is, you know, min so far equals plus, plus infinity <laughs> if min so far is greater than all this then set min so far equal to this. Okay, anyway. <laughs> and at the end of this, return the minimum so far. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm sure. Let, let, let's not be so detailed next time we write pseudocode. Find the minimum of these things, right? So here's a recursive algorithm, and it works, okay? So again, Recursion is like induction. We assume that, so right now I'm trying to set the entire paragraph from the beginning. Now let's assume that I already know how to set, how to typeset the paragraph optimally if I started a line at this word or this word or this word and then typeset the entire rest of the paragraph starting from there. And I can calculate the cost of the line from here to that next line break. It doesn't matter what that function is. It could be the one I erased. It could be nearly anything. Right? You could put all sorts of bells and whistles. You could add hyphenation. You could say that you don't like ending a line the, just before the last word of a sentence. You could say that you don't like a line break between uh, you know, an adjective and the noun it modifies. You could do anything you want. A add whatever aesthetic criteria you want. Okay. So assuming we know how to solve this problem optimally for every j prime, we now do this minimization and figure out how to solve this problem optimally for every j until we know how to solve it optimally for the entire paragraph. Okay? So there are two facial expressions. <laughs> Some of you have heard this speech. One is, I'm totally lost, and the other is, this is completely obvious and I'm bored, and these expressions are identical. So unless you give me more feedback, I won't know which of them they are. And uh, if I get it wrong, then the situation will get worse. So is this clear? 
Can you please explain from that first line again? I'm just going to ask in a few minutes. That, that main this one? Yeah, the next line break, JFM. Right. So the idea is that let's say that I'm currently figuring out how to best typeset the part of the paragraph that starts with the jth word, assuming that that is at the beginning of a line. Okay. Okay. So basically, we're assuming that there's a line break just before the jth word, and I'm trying to find the lowest cost way. Actually, maybe you've noticed, I'm actually trying to calculate the cost, but finding the lowest cost way to do it turns out to be pretty much as easy as finding the lowest cost. So um, I, I want to figure out the lowest cost way to typeset the rest of the paragraph, assuming that the next line starts at WJ. Uh, I, 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 so the, the point is that how, what's the best way to do this? Well, there's going to be some first line break. Okay. And wherever that first line break is, the total cost of this way of typesetting this part of the paragraph is the cost of this top line plus the rest of it. But the rest of it is the same function, but now starting with the J prime plus first word if the line break is after the J prime word. Okay. So the point is I'm trying to find where the best where the best location for the next line break is, and it's whatever J prime minimizes this sum, the cost of this next line plus all the rest. Okay. All right. And is this slightly mangled pseudocode clear enough? So I'm just I'm doing this minimization. I'm just writing it out yeah, as pseudocode. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, mathematically, I could stop here, but since it's a computer science class, I guess I should write something with curly brackets. Yeah. Okay. Right. But mathematically, this is all I need to say. Yeah. It's it's so you just kind of recursive way uh, enumerate all possible, you know, kind of line breaks to get the minimum. But what is? But this is the problem, problem, right? I mean, yeah. So so if. I mean, there's an exp there's an exponential number yeah. of possible way possible places I could put the line breaks. So, if I just do if that, if I do it that directly, it'll take exponential time. Yeah, so. it's, it's, it is what you're doing here, right? Or how I, how, I mean, how does dyna dynamic programming helps to kind of avoid? Okay. Well, so the, I mean, so basically, the, dynamic programming problems are ones that you can write down in a form that looks a bit like yeah. this. Yeah. So it says, so I mean, dividing conquer problems, if you like, are ones where you can just divide the problem into two parts and solve them independently of each other, mm -hmm. and then do a little extra work. That's how merge sort works. Here, I might not be able to do that, I mean, because there are these trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can't, I can't optimize the first line separate from the other lines. Okay. Dynamic programming, though, has so dynamic programming problems are ones where there are interactions between the parts of the problem, but once you make certain decisions, then the problem breaks apart. So, for instance, suppose that in the course of typesetting this paragraph with all these words, suppose that I happened to know that there was going to be a line break after this particular word, OK? If I know that, then I can typeset everything up to that word independently of everything after that word. OK, the problem is I don't know that yet. So dynamic programming problems, if you like, are problems where there are some decisions to be made. Once you make these decisions, then the different parts of the problem become independent of each other. So it's a little bit trickier than divide and conquer. But okay. it's, said, it's sort of like divide and conquer where you have to figure out where to place the division. But, but, but as you said, the dynamic program is basically a recursion. Yeah, kind of without repetition. 
Right. Right. So that, yeah. So let me let's so let's say this because kind of no revenue here. Is that true or? Well, the, okay. So what's what's the why? Okay. What will happen if you just run this algorithm? How long will it take? Exponentially. It'll take exponential time unless you have some sort of really brilliant compiler. Uh -huh. Because what will happen is if I have you know say a five word sentence, I ask it. Okay, typeset the whole thing for me. Calculate f of 1. And it'll say, well, let's see. I could place the line break here, or here, or here, or here, or I guess there. And in the course of figuring out the cost of each of those possible actions, it will ask, well, let's see. What is f of 2? What is f of 3? What is f of 4? What is f of 5? Over and over again. But now when I run, when I ask it this, it will say, gee, hmm, I could place the line break here or here or here, and it will ask, what is f of 3? What is f of 4? Okay. So naive recursion will take, it's easy to do the math and sh show that it will take exponential time, because it will recalculate the same thing, solving the same part of the problem over and over and over again. Okay. So in our remaining three minutes, there are, so what do we want to avoid? So at one level, dynamic recursion is, sorry, dynamic programming is simply recursion without redoing things. So all you have to do is memorize what you've already done. For some reason, I'll never understand computer scientists say memoize. Ugh. You should never invent a new word when there's a perfectly good one already. So just, just memorize what you've already done. And each time you are calculating the function, Check to see for that input whether you already have done it. So just maintain a list of all the cases that you've already calculated. And don't recalculate. So that is a sort of top-down implementation. Recursion with memo memorization is a top-down implementation. There is also a bottom-up implementation, which is how it's often taught, which is to solve the problem backwards, right? And you always have these two choices when you think about recursion. You can always think about it from top down or from bottom up. Doing it backwards, you could say, well, I'll start at the rear end of the paragraph. I'll figure out how to typeset this optimally. Once I know that, I can figure out how to typeset this optimally, because the best way to, uh, sorry, this part optimally, because the best way to do that is either to put a line break here or to put them all on one line. Once I know which one of those is better, I now can apply the same thing and figure out how to typeset this optimally, and so on. So this way, I, I'm saying I'm, I'm calling this bottom up because it's saying that once you know f of 5, then f of 4 is easy. Then once you know f of 4 and f of 5, f of 3 is easy, and so on. And so this is often described as filling in a table and so on. But the great thing is, in this class, implementation details don't matter. So as soon as we realize that a recursive algorithm, even if it naively takes exponential time, as soon as we realize it only takes polynomial time, if we remember what we've already done, we know the problem is in P. And we don't care whether you want to talk about filling in tables or just rec doing recursion with memoization. Um, there's one more way I should put this. And there are phrases which I'm not sure are worth knowing, like optimal substructure and other fancy sounding phrases. The point is that think about all the sub problems which you're going to need to solve in the course of solving this problem. Okay? In this typesetting example, there's actually only order n subproblems that you need to solve. Namely, the entire thing, or the entire thing starting with the second word, or the whole thing starting with the third word, and so on. Okay? So when you once you realize that the optimum cost can be written in this way, you realize, hey, the only problems I'm ever solving are the ones that start at a certain word and then go to the end. Well, there's only n different such problems. 
So once you know that you only need that you only need to solve a polynomial number of different subproblems, then you basically know that the problem can be solved in polynomial time using dynamic programming. So think about the Hamiltonian path problem. We can also describe that as a sort of dynamic programming, right? Is there a Hamiltonian path from here? Well, 